Hello, I'm Patrick Jenkins, the FT's financial editor. We're here today to talk about disruption in deal making, and we're talking to Fitch. First of all, I'm delighted to be joined by James Longsden, who is the head of financial institutions in Europe, Middle East, and Africa at Fitch. Uh, James, welcome. Thank you. Um, M and A in banking has become quite a buzz theme. Um, thinking recently of the abortive efforts of Deutsche Bank and Commerzbank to get together in Germany, and there's been rumours of other cross-border deals uh, across Europe. We've seen some deals in the US recently. Um, why is there so much M and A chatter at the moment in banking? Well, I think there's a number of reasons why uh, M and A is such a big deal. Uh, at the moment for you know, Deutsche Bank and Commerzbank in particular that was really around question marks around their ability to I suppose deliver their strategies of trying to improve returns in a quicker way so they wanted to investigate that further and of course what they found is that you know trying to bring together two or very large banks large banks tend to be much more complicated than small banks almost by definition is an extremely large challenge it entails large costs probably entails needing to raise capital, a lot of execution risk, and I think importantly, a lot of management time. And so unless you can have really very compelling sort of maths to get over those uh, execution risk type hurdles, so the maths from synergies, then it's always gonna be a very high hurdle to, to get a deal off the ground. Um, and I think also what it proves is um, that having distractions uh, is also something of an impediment um, to, to merging. Um, Deutsche Bank clearly having to deal with the sort of weak earnings at its investment bank and, and merging its former post bank and, and Commerce Bank also in fact in the middle of a sort of strategic plan. What we're starting to see now though is that some of these distractions that I think have stopped banks from M&A are starting to erode. So banks' capital positions are getting stronger, some of the big litigation type issues are going away, and maybe some of the asset quality problems are weakening. And some of the just the general restructuring post-crisis is starting to come to an end at a lot of the big banks. So that's, I think, why strategically you start turning your attention a bit more towards M&A. Because, of course, if you rewind a decade or slightly more than a decade to the, um, the, the immediate aftermath of the financial crisis, uh, there were quite a lot of big deals that went on then. Uh, most of them kind of rescues, really, were in the UK of HBOS, in the US of Bear Stearns, for example. Um, since then, that, that hasn't, there's been a decade, really, of, of no big deals. Um, as regulators in particular have been concerned about the too big to fail issue. Uh, they would like banks not to get bigger and they put in place capital restrictions on that really. Um, these so-called uh, systemically important mm -hmm. bank top-ups that banks are required to have if they mm -hmm. get beyond a certain scale. Yeah. That seems to have been a factor, in, in a potential factor anyway, in the Deutsche Commerz idea and certainly it would be in any um, combination of two big banks, wouldn't it? Oh, absolutely, it would be, yes. I think um, capital positions are, yeah, it's almost a sine qua non for a deal. You've got to have a good capital position if you're a big bank looking to buy um, a, a smaller bank, or at least a very compelling argument that to go to your shareholders and ask to raise capital if that's what you need to cover the costs. Uh, capital has been improving quite significantly across the sector. We see average uh, capital ratios now about 14.5%, probably up three percentage points in the last four years. So you're at a level now where with banks are really starting to think about capital and how, capital and how they should be redeploying it. Now, one answer certainly is an acquisition, that potentially is an option. Um, but alternatively, you know, banks, you know, capital is somewhat defined and, and it is somewhat you know, rationed, and the bank executives also have to look at other options they maybe need. So investment in IT, investment in compliance, uh, these sorts of things are other sort of options I suppose they have. Some of them may be more necessities than options in fact. So there are an awful lot of things you have to look at perhaps first or in combination before you can make that step towards a deal. And of course share buybacks is another uh, increasingly popular Yeah, share buybacks uh, is another option. Excess yeah, capital. Absolutely. Um, what if we look um, across the EU, how do you think the economic prospects for, for the EU over the next year or two affect the likelihood of, of particularly cross-border M&A? Because it's no secret that a lot of policymakers would actually like to see that cross-border deal-making in order to prove the, the point, if you like, of mm. there being a single market in Europe um, and maybe to help deliver the uh, capital markets union that, that the EU is trying to put in place. 
Well, I think there's sort of two different things there. I think that the economic prospects, I mean, we, we expect economic growth to slow in Europe, like I think an awful lot of commentators. Um, to some degree, that will put a little bit of a question mark in people's minds, in chief executives' minds, I think, about the, the sense of doing a deal if you are expecting you know, economic weakness or even maybe you know, some of them may be even thinking worse in some countries. So I think that may put, add a little bit of reticence uh, to people uh, making deals. Um, I think there is still fundamentally, though, an interest in some form at some point of further consolidation within Europe. Now, I think banking union is an important part of that question mark, you know, this a free movement of capital and liquidity. I think before you get to that sort of bigger picture one, we will still certainly see a little bit of round the edges rationalisation where, where banks have what I would call sort of coherent logic to expanding maybe into neighbouring countries. So you think of Caixa Bank buying BPI in Portugal, for example, or OTP in Hungary buying up the sort of the SOCGEN assets that it's shedding at the moment. So I think that's probably more likely in the near term at least. Rather than the type of uh, acquisition we saw over the previous decade or more, which was far more adventurous, if you like. You, you mentioned SOCGEN there. They, they went on a, on a buying spree across all kinds of fairly risky economies. Um, many of those acquisitions didn't work out. Yeah. Uh, a lot of French banks bought into Greece, for example. Yes, I think that's, that's absolutely right. And I think what we're starting to see certainly is Diversification, you speak to, to banks management about diversification. There's no doubt if you look at the sort of business models of Santander, BBVA, that diversification has without a shadow of a doubt helped them through you know, the acute financial crisis they had in Spain in, in the mid-2013-2014 you know, type period. But what we're starting to see now, I think, is when banks expand is they're not, I think they need a lot more compelling reason to expand into what you call the sort of retail and SME type banking uh, operation, you know, businesses, unless it's very proximate to their home market. Um, I think their farm, you, know, you look at HSBC, for example, they've been shedding retail and commercial banking businesses in, in large parts of the world and focusing much more where they've got a sort of a large corporate type franchise or a raison d'etre to be operating. I think that is going to be more likely to be the, the sort of the expansionary type um, policy, if you like, uh, um, it, for the big banks in Europe. What, looking more globally, um, what other drivers do you see for M and A? Um, I guess the, the point about diversification applies wherever the um, banks operate in the world. Mm -hmm. um, growth, we've talked about as a kind of a, a, a kind of search mm -hmm. for growth. What else do you think is making management think about M um, and A? IT is going to be a big issue. I think when I look at M&A in Europe, um, the sectors the, or the banks that are going to be perhaps looking more likely to be facing some sort of merger pressure or desire are going to be the sort of mid-sized banks, perhaps in banks with banking sectors with a little bit more overcapacity still, because they're facing quite a few pressures, if you like. Not just economically, you've got low growth, you've got low interest rates. Um, financially, they're all having to start issuing this so-called MREL debt, this sort of bail-in debt to meet resolution requirements. Now, these are banks that haven't really had to access the capital market for quite a while. They've been able to borrow from the ECB or they've been issuing cover bonds. And so there'll be mid-sized names, not well known in the capital markets, raising debt. It'll cost them a reasonable amount of money, certainly more than their deposit funding does. So that's going to put latent pressure on their cost base. But also just this sort of seismic shift in the way consumers operate and expect to be treated in, in kind of all aspects of their life. And banking is no different. You know, and we're talking here really digitalization. I think banks are going to have to be thinking about spending money, which maybe they hadn't previously thought about, increasingly as a necessity on digitalization, because otherwise it's going to be franchise pressuring if they don't. You're going to see people, other big banks who can afford to coming in and taking some of their franchise and therefore you know, reducing their revenues and creating earnings pressure. So I think that mid-market banks in perhaps highly competitive, fragmented banking sectors where all of these earnings pressures are still and headwinds are there, that's where you could see a little bit more M&A. We've certainly you know, seen it um, mid-sized banks in Italy Banco BPM is the product of banks in Italy. It's now the third biggest bank in Italy. Uh, Bankia and BMN in, in Spain. Uh, interestingly, we saw two banks, Unica and Liberbank, call, call a merger off just, just yesterday, I think, the day before yesterday. But even so, that notwithstanding, I still think that is where we could see some, some merger amongst mid-sized banks.
It's definitely a theme to keep an eye on. Uh, James Longston, thanks very much. Thank you very much.